Lord, just bless this time now. Speak through our pastor. Thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Seated. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I've been preaching through 1 Peter. Uh, you might want to pray for my beloved, uh, my beloved Janet. She is sick this morning. She went to the doctor and the doctor said she was sick of me. Uh, no, that's not, that's not true. Uh, she has a double ear infection, uh, throat infection, and uh, a sinus infection. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. And uh, she is a, uh, she's got some medicine in her, and, uh, and we'll just pray that she gets better. And um, I went to the doctor one time, thought I was sick, and he said, man, you've got a big old yellow streak running down in the middle of your spine. I said, well, can you take it out? And he said, yeah, I could, but you wouldn't survive the operation. Amen. Well, I want to ask you a question this morning as we preach God's Word. And it's centered around the question, is it possible to be a holy person in an unholy age? Is it possible? Now, before you answer that question real quick and say, oh yeah, I want to remind you that Monday's coming. And tomorrow, you're going to meet up with uh, your co-workers. The next family reunion's coming. The next time you get news and information uh, from our world that seems to be in chaos. And sometimes, to be honest with you, brothers and sisters, it is nearly impossible to be holy. Now when I use the word holy, when the Bible uses the word holy, it, it is, has a very specific meaning. It means something that is set apart. Set apart for something. And out of that, that term holiness has been attributed to God. In fact, holiness is an attribute a characteristic of God that is one of those rare characteristics that is described in triplets. For example, the Bible never says God is love, love, love. But repeatedly, there are places where it says God is holy, holy, holy. What's interesting about the word holiness is when it comes to God, God possesses holiness in absolute perfection. Morally, eternally, God is holy. And what God has always purposed is for Him to have a people that reflect who He is to some degree. And so then the question comes, is it possible to be holy? to be a person who is set apart, to be someone who is becoming more spiritually mature, more spiritually pure in their living, is it possible? And, and I've mentioned things externally to us, the world and the challenges there, but think about your own heart. Think about your own heart. I, I, I don't know about you, but People say, well, just trust your heart. Just go with your heart. Can I remind you what the Bible says? The heart is desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? And so here we're faced with this incredible conundrum. We have a holy God that places on us a holy call, and yet we are immediately confronted by the obstacle outside of us to be holy. We don't live in a holy culture. We don't live in a culture that is, that is friendly to God. And we're also confronted by the obstacle of our own heart. That our hearts and minds are not always pure. They're not always righteous. Well, let's go to the Word of God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to begin with verse 13. And maybe we can get a game plan before we leave here today. So Peter writes, 
Therefore, prepare, some of your translations may say, gird up your minds, and we'll talk about what that means. Prepare your minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that would be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions or the lust of your former ignorance, but as, here's the key verse, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed, you were redeemed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was made manifest in the last days for the sake of you who through him are, being, are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. And God's people said, Amen. Would you please look back at verse 15 and 16. This text, this passage of text, if you were to be in a seminary class, would be like a flower. And right at the center of all the petals would be the center of this text. And the center of this text is verse 15 and 16, where we have the call to be holy, and they're called to be holy by holy God, and then in verse 16, he quotes an Old Testament passage, and he says, you be holy, for I am holy. Now, God has always had a people for himself. Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15 remind us that God called Abraham, and he said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to cause you to be my people, and you will be a blessing, I will bless you, and all the world will be blessed through you. Leviticus 11.44 tells us that we are to be holy just as God is holy. The Bible also tells us in Titus 2.14 that we are to be, we are a peculiar people. We are a people set apart. We're strange people because of what we believe in, how we act. And then the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, and we'll get to that here in the next few weeks, that we are to be holy without spot or blemish. In other words, the call here is to be holy. But the question comes, brothers and sisters, how can we be made holy? Let me up the ante. We are to be holy in our worship. You know what that means? That means right now some of you are distracted and thinking about your to-do list for tomorrow. Because we have spiritual ADD. We're always thinking about something else, the sermon or whatever, when we realize that when we come to worship, we are coming for an audience of one. We are coming to worship one person with other believers. We are called to be holy in our fellowship. We are called to be holy in our families. We are called to be holy in how we engage the culture. We are called to be holy in our mission and still yet, the challenge comes, how in the world can we be holy? I'll be honest with you. The other day when I was going through uh, to get a coffee somewhere, I, I didn't feel holy. Because it was slow. It was not fast food. You ever had that experience? And then you get impatient at home. Anybody ever been impatient with your spouse? Can I get a witness on this? Some of you are looking at each other. And you get impatient with your kids. And all of a sudden, this verse comes ringing back, Be holy, for I'm holy. I want you to be set apart, different, unique, righteous, pure. And I've got some news for you. You can't do it. Well, preacher, you've set us up. What do you mean 
if the Bible commands it, what do you mean we can't do it? Well, I've got good news for you. So, I'm going to love this part of the message. You, you stick with me. Let's do some theology. We, we serve an awesome God. Amen? Amen? God is sovereign. He is eternal. He had no birth date. He has no expiration date. He is totally self-sufficient. Nothing adds to him. Nothing detracts from him. All of the worlds could be obliterated and God would still be God. He is God all by himself. He is an uncreated being. He is holy, righteous, sovereign, merciful, loving, providential. He was not created. His being, he is being in of himself. He does not have derived being like you do, like I do. My parents, I was derived from my parents. I am dependent on certain things. God is not. God is all by himself. He's not wringing his hands in the heavens because he's lost control of his creation. The Bible says that he sits enthroned above his creation, is active in his creation, and he will bring his creation to its consummation, which will bring him glory. We do not serve a lame God. We serve an awesome God. Now, how can we be made holy? We have the need for holiness. And because we serve an, a God who is holy, who does not derive his, his existence from outside of himself, guess what he has done for us? In his son, Jesus Christ, he has taken out of his own being a gift that enables us to have what we would not otherwise have. Now get this. Watch the language. Look in verse 15 and 16. We have the call to be holy. Be holy. Be ye holy. And then notice what it says in verse 16. God says, I am holy. Now stick with me here. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to get this. God declares himself, I am holy. I am who I am. This goes back to Exodus chapter 3. When Moses saw the burning bush and he went before him and he was getting ready to go to Pharaoh to call Pharaoh to let his people go. And here's the, here's the cool thing about this. Moses says, who shall I say sent me? What, do you have a business card, God? What's, on, what's your name? And God said to Moses, Moses, you tell Pharaoh, I am that I am has sent you. What does that mean? It means that God has always been himself and he can be no other. It means that God existed before time began. He will exist after time goes out of, out of time. He is above time. He is in time. He is over time. He is above all time. He is our great sovereign God. He doesn't borrow. He's not added to. He is an awesome, awesome God. And this God stepped into time and eternity with his holiness intact, his righteousness un undefiled and guess what he did in the person of Jesus Christ he gave to us what we don't have in and of ourselves that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ God takes out of his being I am holy and helps you fulfill the command to be holy through the holiness of Jesus Christ, may his name be praised. I'm about to get Pentecostal. You just go ahead and let me have a fit up here. That's all right. Brothers and sisters, the I am of holiness 
gives us His holiness so that we can be holy because of a holy, righteous God who gave us a holy, righteous Savior and empowers us through a holy, righteous Spirit. So on your own, you can't be holy. I can't be holy. So if you walk out of here this morning with the idea, man, I just got to try harder. I just got, I got to get me a list. I got to get me a list of all the things. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. You'll never do it. You'll never do it. It's not doing first. Now listen, it's not doing first. It's being first. God makes you to be something so that you can do something. I'll give you a verse. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift. Lest any man should boast. God saves us by His grace. Amen? Amen. And then what's He do? He makes us be something. He He. he he lends us, if you will, out of His eternal reservoir of being something we don't have by grace. And once He does that, then notice what the text says. Though you're saved by grace, and we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You see, many of you have the idea of holiness backwards. You think you have to be holy in order for you to be acceptable to God. You'll never do it. Never do it. You must become holy so you can live holy. Remember that. You must become holy. And the only way you can become holy, become righteous, become forgiven is through the person of Jesus Christ. Can, can I go one step further? If you're kind of like me, self-sufficient, going to do it on my own, this is really humbling. The grace of God is humbling. The grace of God is humbling. So, once the I am of holiness has made us holy, what's that look like? What's it look like? Well, that's why this text is like a beautiful flower. That at the center of it, verse 15 and 16, the call to holiness by a holy God, and we're made holy by the great I am through Jesus Christ. Then let's look at the petals. Look at verse 13. And I'll run through these real quick. We are to be holy, first of all, in our minds. Notice what it says. It says, gird up your loins, prepare your minds. We, we don't talk like that. The King James, I was raised on the King James, beautiful language. Gird up your loins. What does that mean? It means that sometimes in those days they wore garments that were flowing. And, and, and the writer here, Peter, says, look, get, get your stuff together. Get your mind together together that the holiness of God first permeate, permeates your mind that we are to be holy in our thinking and notice we're to have a prepared mind an active mind a sober mind and a mind that's set on hope you see brothers and sisters most of the battles that we face most of the spiritual battles that we face in our effort to be holy or to live this out happens between your ears the biggest battlefield is right here between your ears. That's why the Bible says repeatedly that we're to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. And so the first, the first fruit of the root of holiness is a mind that is prepared, active, engaged with things that are godly and good. Look at the second thing, verse 14. The mind and then the will. Notice what it says that we are to be obedient. 
We are to be obedient. And then it says, and do not be conformed any longer to the lust or the passions that you used to operate in in your times of ignorance. What's interesting here is that, is that Peter is saying, look, your mind, when you're made holy in Jesus Christ, that manifests itself in how you think. In fact, can, can I just stop right here? Is it amazing? We, we, have, we have raised a generation of young men and women who, who have a difficult time connecting, what I call connecting dots. And, and I want to tell you a story, true story. I'm talking with this young lady. I, maybe I've shared this before. I'm talking with this young lady, and her life is in a mess. She's probably about 35, and she's just trying to figure this all out. And I'm trying to help her and pray with her and talk with her through this thing. But along her, her way, she's just dealt with, she just made all kinds of decisions. Her think, she had stinking thinking. And I asked her this question. I said, do you think that where you have come to in your life has anything to do with the decisions you've made along the way? And you know what she said? Do you really think so? Because she had developed the thinking that life kind of just happens to you. That you're out of control. That, that you know, you don't have any choices. And her mind had to be changed. God had to do a new work in changing her mind that she had in Jesus Christ a whole new set of decisions she could make. She, in Jesus Christ, she had a whole new set of options. And notice in verse 14, he says, that's why when you have right thinking that's been made holy and pure, set apart by God, then that means that we are to be obedient to what God has called us to do. We're not obedient to become holy. We are obedient because we are holy. If you try to be obedient and have a to-do list, you're a legalist and you're going to die and go to hell. Nobody ever goes to heaven by keeping a list. You go to heaven because of Jesus, who saves you from that list, and then He does an amazing thing. He does a work in your life so that you can turn around and keep the list. Isn't that weird? That's what the law is. Some people say, well, I've obeyed the Ten Commandments. Well, a man, young man came to Jesus one day and said, I've obeyed the Ten Commandments, and Jesus knew he hadn't. Jesus, okay, I've done all these things. Jesus knew where his sweet spot was, and you know what he said? Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor. And the Bible says he walked away sad because he had much wealth. That man was trying to be saved because he was trying to keep a bunch of lists. He had an unholy, impure, unsaved, unrighteous heart. And you can't go to heaven by keeping a list of doing good things. You can only go to heaven because your life has been transformed by Jesus Christ. And when he transforms your will, now you want to do what you could not otherwise do. Can I get a witness on this? Somebody say amen. And so... We're not only changed in our thinking, we're changed in our will. And guess what? We're no longer a cookie cutter. The, we're no longer conformed to the passions of our lust. Look at another thing. Look at verse 17. I love this. He, he, in, in fact, this will blow your mind. Verse 17, here's what he says. He says, if you, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now stop right there. What is he saying? Why does he bring up the word fear? Now listen very carefully. Peter knew that when God makes you holy, makes you righteous, gives you something you don't deserve or have in and of yourself, when he does that, it not only changes your thinking, and it not only changes your will, but it changes what you're afraid of. Most people live lives of fear, fearing all the wrong things. There is only one fear that is proper and righteous. Now get this. Peter says 
The only kind of fear that you should fear have is a fear, a reverence, an awe of your heavenly Father. And it's not the kind of fear that crouches. It's the kind of awe and respect that you have for a father who loves you. You know the problem that many of you have? Is you're more afraid of offending your friends and your family members than you are of offending God. You, if you're a man pleaser or a man fearer, you can't please God. That's a hard word. That's a hard word. Let me up the ante. You know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10? He said, don't fear the one who can kill your body, but can't kill your soul, the devil. Fear him who can kill both body and soul, and if he wanted to, cast you into hell. See, here's where he's headed. He says, while you're in this exile, fear him who will judge you, knowing that he will judge you through his son, Jesus Christ, and have that fear. Now, let me stop right here. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm about to lose my voice. I preached a lot in the last week. Did you get this logic? When we come to Christ and he robes us in his holiness, the I am of holiness gives us his holiness in his son, Jesus Christ. Our thinking is different. Our acting is di our will. And guess what? We are more conscious of him and his holiness and not offending God than we are anybody else around us. You say, well, that's, that's a big theological point. That's not very practical. Yeah, it is. Let's say that you're with your friends, you're in your family, and they want to do something stupid. Anybody ever ask you to do something stupid? And you're thinking, well, I know that I don't need to do that. I don't need to think that. I don't need to go there. And it's not because you're a legalist, it's just it's not right. And you know what's thinking in the back of your mind? Just what's in my back of my mind. Well, if I say I don't want to do that, they'll make fun of me, and I won't be on the in group, I'll be on the out group, and I don't know what I'm going to do. You know what's happened to you? You are more afraid of what they think than what he thinks. God wants us to rightly fear him. Not in a cowering kind of thing, but in a holy reverence for God. And we are to live, look in verse 18 and 19. We are to live redeemed lives. Notice what it says. It says that we have been purchased, we have been redeemed, we have been ransomed, not with things that are silver or gold. What does it say we've been ransomed with? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Is that what it says? Look at your text. We have been ransomed with something even more precious than the commodities market, the stock market. We have been ransomed with something that doesn't go up or down with every political whim. We have been ransomed through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Let me be even more specific. When a person comes to Jesus and they have received the call to be holy and they have been confronted by this conundrum, I'm called to be holy, but I can't be. God provides the remedy in His Son, Jesus Christ, that when we come to Him by faith, He gives us a gift that we don't have in and of ourselves. He gives us righteousness, forgiveness, and holiness. When that takes place, He begins to change our mind. He begins to change our will. And then we can live differently. And then we have a right fear that we're now more fearful and reverent of Him than we are anything here. And then on top of that, we need to remember that God doesn't save trash with trash. 
God chose, listen, to put His precious blood on you. I, I have people coming to me all the time, all oh, shucks, God doesn't love me. Are you kidding me? Well, you don't know what I've done. I don't. You don't know what I've done. I'm just here to tell you, God so loved the world that you know what He did? I love what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says that He has placed the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ in jars of clay. Now live like it. Live as if you are a king or a queen, a prince or a princess, because God has taken His precious blood and ransomed you. Ransomed you from sin, death, hell, and the grave. Now in this church, right out here in the foyer, we have a trophy case. There's a lot of books and stuff in it, but when I first came here, it was up on this landing right up here, and it had all kinds of trophies. And that was awesome. But there are more people who love the case. And you look at the beautiful wood, and people will often ask me when they come in here, where'd you get that? Would you want to sell it? Well, for $50,000, let's see if we can make a deal. Amen? <laughs> but it's a beautiful case, isn't it? But you know, all those trophies, what was good is the trophy. The trophy won something. It represented something that's won. It represented something precious. It represented something that was done, complete, finished. And the focus wasn't on the case. Though beautiful. You know what God has done with you and me? He has made us a beautiful trophy case. And He's taken... Your cracked life, my broken life, and he has taken his precious blood. And he goes, hmm, let's see how this looks here. Let me take the precious blood of the Lamb of God, and I'm going to put it in the trophy case of Jeff Gayhart's life. How does that look there? Does he live, does he live as a trophy case of the grace of God? Does he live with what's in the case? Brothers and sisters, God has ransomed us with His precious blood. And that's good news. There's one final thing. Look, if you will, in verse 20 and 21. I love this. Verse 20. Just to let you know that this whole thing's not an afterthought, look what it says. He, that is Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you who through Him are believers in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. <laughs> I wish I could get this out of me. But how can you be holy? You can't. Apart from Jesus. And in Jesus, God gives you something that you don't have and you don't deserve. But because of His great mercy, He gives you righteousness. He gives you holiness. That way we can be holy. He perfectly we imperfectly until we see His face. He changes our mind. He changes our will. He gives us a holy fear of Him. He lets us know that we have been saved by the precious blood of Jesus. And then He wants us to know this hasn't been an afterthought. Somewhere back, now get your brain around this, somewhere back, eons before there was anything I think, if I could use my sanctified imagination, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were in conversation with each other. And the Father said, how could we best display our glory? And the Son said, let's redeem a people who will give you praise and honor. 
And Father, let's up the ante. Let's let these people be broken and sinful. And the Holy Spirit will come and He will indwell them. He will be their God and they will be His people. And so the Bible tells us that before the foundations of the world, he was, this plan was known to the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And then in the fullness of time, God created a world in which men and women would sin. And yet because of the preordained plan of God, eons ago, God stepped into history in the person of Jesus Christ, took off His regal robe of all of His eternal attributes, was found in the likeness of humble men, and He became humble even to the death on the cross, wherefore God has highly exalted Him and given Him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, everything, everyone, everywhere, every tongue shall kneel and confess everything in heaven and in earth and under the earth shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this plan that was known, this person that was known before the foundation of the world was now manifest in time and space. Jesus really lived. He really died. He really rose again. And He's really coming back. Amen. And the reason we can live holy is because Jesus Christ is at the center of our life. Be ye holy, for I am holy. How are you feeling right now? Listen, you know how I'm feeling? And I'm preaching. I don't feel very holy. I don't. I don't feel very holy. There are days I don't feel holy. Oh, you're just saying that for a sermon illustration. No. I didn't feel holy the other day when I was coming back from the hospital. And there's nowhere to go. And I'm already doing 80 miles an hour. And there's a guy in my trunk. And I don't have anywhere to go. And he finally, I finally get over. He's doing 80. He, he passes me by. And I'm already thinking, get out of my trunk. I, I, of course, I said it in Christian love. Amen. And he got right up next to me and he, he waved at me with only one finger. Amen? And when he got by me, California license plates. I said, get out of my state. No, I didn't say that. I don't feel holy then. I don't feel holy when I see a daddy that beat his child to death. I don't feel holy when I'm impatient with my children and my family and my wife. And then God whispers in my ear through His Spirit, Kevin, don't, don't, don't accept the devil's lie that it's what you do first that makes you holy. You are accepted. You are beloved. You're mine. And can I tell you what happens when the Holy Spirit reminds me of that? It makes me want to weep. It makes me thankful. It makes me rejoice. It, it makes me seek Him all the more. Let's pray. Father, is it possible to do what You've called us to do? And the answer is on our own no. And even more than that, sometimes we try to do it on our own. We get a list. We put it on a refrigerator. And in our pride and self-sufficiency, we'll say, well, I'll, if I do this and this and this and this. And yet it seems like we constantly fail. And then the list falls off the refrigerator. And we forgot what was even on the list. Lord, help us to rest in your holiness. That you who, are, who have underived, uncreated being, perfect and pure in all of your ways, we could never add anything to you, take anything from you. You have chosen in your grace and mercy to give us what we do not have 
and what we do not deserve. And you did that in Jesus. Now, Father, help us to lean into Jesus. Help us to stand on Jesus. Help us to love Jesus. Lord, by your Spirit, enable us. Give us a willing heart to love you even more. Lord, there are many believers here in this room who love you and have walked with you for many years and you have walked with them. And there are days that they get up and they think, am I really saved? Am I really holy? Father, remind them today that because they've cast themselves on the mercy of God in Christ, they're, they're in you and they're safe. And Father, there may be some here today that they do not know that kind of holiness. They're still in the effort mode, the list mode, the legalism mode, the works mode of trying to earn your favor. Lord, help them today to trust you. To trust you. Would you please stand?